time for another edition of Real Combo with Alan Mennick and Miranda Kahn. Making a difference because you matter. If everybody's working on principles of stuff, you end up in a position where you're not trying to teach this specific little thing to this person who has an attention span of this. You know, yeah. you end up in a place where you take a very broad brush stroke and you bring people who all have stuff they know they have to work on and you take a principle that kind of attaches to all of them and they all get to improve in depth, you know. Uh, it's like making someone read a book over and over again. Yeah. They read it the first time and they get a particular interpretation. You make them read it again and all of a sudden you have a completely different interpretation of something that you thought you understood before and you end up in a place where your knowledge deepens and you have a more authentic attachment to what you read. Yeah. If that makes sense. You know? Yeah. Hey, Miranda, did you hear that, by the way? What? You didn't hear the Irish? The oh. Oh, yeah, I can hear the accent. Why right. do you think I'm so captivated? <laughs> no, but... I, but like, you can say whatever you want, and I'm just like, go ahead, keep talking. <laughs> this is no, this is really good. I should be I should be uh, starting the show with this, but, uh, you know, it's because it's like with Mary... Actually, we should go into it right now, because, like, with Mary, mm. you know, she um, yells at me all the time because I watch the same show over and over and over again, and she's like, why are you watching the same show? I'm like, I pick things up every time I watch the show again. There's I can't do that. It drives me nuts. Mm -hmm. You know, you know that whole movie, what is it, Groundhog Day? Yeah. I couldn't uh, watch yeah. that because it was like, I can't see the same thing over and over again. I know. But, but actually, you're that guy, and you're that, that was guy. The premise, it was the whole premise of the thing, though. I mean, that was it, is you go through it the first time, and if you get it wrong, you get to look at what, and you pick up all of these, these skills on the way to becoming the person you're supposed to be. Yeah, and that's the whole point of it. But I got to tell you, Miranda, you'd be really – actually, I was trying to really impress you because I was like – Oh, really? Uh, well, I'm you know how I, you know how I always say that I don't – every day. <laughs> you know how I always say I don't like to do research or anything like that because I like to be a show of spontaneous and ask questions and all this other stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I'm like, you know what, let me do a little bit of research. And I'm like, who's the best person to, to look at for what our topic is today? And I'm like, you know – Chuck Norris is a lot of people's hero and this and that. And so I was looking at it and all I kept on coming up on, on different quotes from him, you know, like how he's invincible and stuff. So yeah. this one, so there was one that, I mean, the one I liked was, you know, Chuck Norris, Chuck Norris, when he jumps in water, the water gets Chuck Norris. But here's one for you. Chuck Norris doesn't actually write books. The words assemble themselves out of fear. So that's what you got to start doing with your writing right now. Ooh, I like wow, that. Wow, that was like deep. They assemble themselves out of fear. That was deep. And, you know, it's, yeah, you're trying to take that in as he's wearing a disappearing cowboy hat. <laughs> no, I know. If, uh, he, he comes in and out. It's like, and I love it. That yeah, but don't, don't which, which way am I going? Oh, there it is. Don't I look like this guy right here? Oh. Yeah. I oh, mean, yeah. the gut, the gut's a little bit, you know. Smaller, but you know, on that character. But anyway, this is a good one I like though. Um, the biggest back to school bullies are anxiety, worry, and fear. And again, that's Chuck Norris. So I love that because it, it's true. So, Miranda, I introduced you already, but I want to introduce you to Dave Wilson uh, from Polari Studios. And Dave is a really, <laughs> Dave's, a, I've known him for a while, but he's a really impressive guy. Dave is actually in the Martial Arts Hall of Fame? Is that what it yeah, is? World, the world. The world Martial Arts Hall of Fame, yes. Yeah. So That's he's really kind impressive. of a big deal. He's a he very big deal. Very, very big. big deal. He's a very big deal. And, you know, I, I wanted to get him on again. I had him on my radio show. I want to have him on here again because everything that we're going through right now with this, this pandemic and everybody cooped up at home, you know, it pays a toll on your mental health. And when I look at martial arts... I look at it in a different way. It's just not a physical. It's not, you know, you know, there's another one that Chuck Norris had here. It's like, you know, when Chuck Norris, when the world spins, like the world punches Chuck Norris in the back of the head or something like that. It was like pretty funny, but it's not about fighting. It's not, there's a lot of mental health that goes into um, the martial arts. Dave, can, can you broaden a little bit? How do you get somebody in the frame of mind for martial arts? It's not about fighting, okay. is it? So, um, had people come into the studio and I've been 
I've owned the school for 15 years. Uh, February was the start of my 16th year of owning this school. Uh, I've been involved in the martial arts for 30 years. Uh, off and on prior to that, but seriously involved in the martial arts for 30 years. And I got into the martial arts because I had been bullied. Um, in fact, if I'm honest, I've been both sides of the bullying thing. You know, you're pushed a little bit and you start wanting to find a place where you can push. And you push those that are smaller than you, weaker than you, or less able to defend themselves than you. And then all of a sudden you come up against this wall of someone that doesn't want to be pushed. And you recognize that it's, it's, a, it's kind of like a downward trickle. You, you feel someone comes in who's been judged and they feel the right to judge somebody else. And it's just passing that kind of thing down to the next person and down to the next person. Well, when you come into the martial arts, everybody puts on a white uniform and puts on a white belt and they're, they're all standing there in a line and they're all looking at each other, wondering what they're supposed to do. And all of a sudden, no one's judging them. No one's questioning what they know. No one's que And if they want to see who knows more than them, they look to the person that has the next colored belt or the next colored belt or the next colored belt. And in actual fact, you start to see people looking from that belt to see how far they've come rather than to see how much more they know than that person. So they can, um, I guess they can relate more to the journey. Mm, okay. like the, teacher, the teachers would say, remember to tend the path that got you to where you are because others will want to follow. So if you're going through this mental aspect of, I know all this stuff, well, no, you're following a path where there's someone that knows more than you do. There's always going to be someone bigger, badder, better, stronger in mind, stronger in yeah. the way they approach things, stronger. So you always have someone to look to to try and get an answer about what's next or where you're supposed to go. And when you get confused about someone, you know that you can turn to someone who may have the answer. And if they don't have the answer, they know who to ask for that answer. Yeah. And so, so, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Finish up what you were saying. No, I was just saying you know you were talking about you can't get any better i'm like i don't know i mean you're in the world hall of fame but i had to be Where do you go up on someone that? someone had to recognize what i was doing right. and i was being inducted by not only one of my teachers yeah. but see yeah. two of my teachers were present and my original teacher was being inducted with me so yeah. here's a guy who taught me the majority of what i know who's a ninth degree black belt, he's being inducted. Here's another guy standing at the other end of the line. He's a ninth degree black belt. He's being inducted. I'm sitting at the table with a 10th degree, a 15th degree, a couple of billionaires, and, and I'm going, am I supposed to be here? <laughs> <laughs> going, it's not about the number of little stripes that are on your belt, but it's about the approach and the contribution to your students, the dynamic, the relationship you have with the community, what you bring to the table as a person, more so than what the last move was you learned or what the right. last is. Or, and it allows you to kind of see, well, there's a lot of people sitting around this table and they all have different opinions. And I don't really want to argue with any of them because, you know, realistically, there aren't too many people sitting at the table that couldn't kick my butt. Yeah, that's good. You know, I wanted to go back real quickly, Ellen, if I could, because I something you brought up about the whole bullying thing, you know, as a children's book author, one of the things that I focused on in the Blossoms of Floraland was bullying. So I'm so glad that you brought that up because a lot of us can relate to that. I mean, I, I was bullied as a kid. My sister was bullied as a kid. And it's, it's amazing. I've had people years later, not going to date myself any more than I already do on the show, a few years ago. And they've actually reached out to me and, you know, said, I'm so sorry that I picked on you. So I think that's so important because that takes a toll on mental health, Alan. I mean, we talk Absolutely. about it with the suicide rate, right? When it comes to, to young people, 
as young as 10 years old. The numbers have tripled. It's the second leading cause of death. And a lot of it comes from bullying, right? It's and, a start. Yeah. I mean, it can't, not all of it, but some of it. So Dave, if you could like, take, you know, take us back. No, I, I'm just curious. <laughs> well, like, realistically, <laughs> if, if you need me to take you back, I can... It, <clears throat> <laughs> I'm probably going to get phone calls from my family in a minute, but you know, it's uh, as okay, I was going. We want the up, Irish accent, so just we want them to call. <laughs> All right. So, I, my mother and father divorced when I was four years old. Okay. I have an older brother, seven years older than me, and I have an older sister, five years older than me. Um, so, in my social upbringing, I was always kind of the one that was on the mother's apron string so to speak because my older brother and my older sister had gone off to school i was always around the house and in that i we was call that mama's boy just so you know <laughs> well, that's fine i dare anybody to call me that now and i'll tell him yes i still am a mama's okay, boy there today. you go there she'll you go. beat you up if you call me names <laughs> <laughs> i love it the the funny thing was is at four years old my parents divorce put me as a kid that didn't have a circle of friends. So I was always in this camp or in that camp, or I had a suitcase in my hand. And when I would get into a group of uh, a social group, I was always the one that was trying to fit in. Mm -hmm. So it could be, you know, the one who was running this, the, the, the ring of friends, so to speak, They'd be like, no, no, you're not. And I might be the last one picked or I might be uh, the last one called to come and do stuff. And it gave me a, a difficult social interaction. So I became the not so nice kid. I became the kid that broke things in public for attention. I maybe vandalized stuff. I would maybe stand up for the little kid and give someone a bop. But at the same time, my, that was my way of kind of, I was kind of the crazy kid. Mm -hmm. um, and as time went by, this rebellious child then came into the view of his now 21-year-old brother and his working father who were estranged from me because my brother moved to England when, I was, when he was 16 years old which left me in Ireland at nine years old living with my mother. Hmm. So didn't have the big brother to relate to. And when I did see him, it was work. I would go to England. We were working in the yard. We were doing this. We were doing that. And if I didn't do something right, I got the smack up the back of the head. Yep. And my yep. brother became the surrogate kind of father figure for me because my dad was always doing deals and wheeling and dealing. And there wasn't a lot of family time while I was there. And again, no real social circle of friends, so I didn't really fit in. Mm -hmm. And then as time went by, I became more and more estranged from them. And then the hair was long, and I'd show up for the summer. And my father and my brother were very... Yeah, my hair was long. My hair was long at one time, too. Yeah, look, look at it. <laughs> I want to see pictures. Yeah, uh, take a look right now. I'm the same as you. <laughs> Now you fast forward and you've got this rebellious teenager who wants to be his own self. He's living in America. He's being considered a mama's boy by his older brother. I'm getting into trouble and different stuff. And as I get back to the, the UK, I'm told, cut your hair. You're going to work for the summer. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And I'm going, no. I'm my own person. I'm 17 years old. You're not telling me what to do. And it became one of these. Mm. And then it became one of these. Mm. And then it was get me out of here. And then it became a bit of this. Mm. And when I came back to the States, I had vowed that that situation wouldn't happen to me again. And therefore, to gain confidence in myself and confidence in my ability, I joined the martial arts. And... In a but what side drew you to it? What drew you to it? I mean, was it Chuck Norris, like Alan over there? <laughs> well, I was, 
I watched as a kid. I watched all the Chuck Norris movies, Octagon, and and Good Guys Wear Black, and Breaker Breaker, and all of these. I watched. What about Bruce I, Lee? You didn't watch Bruce my dad Lee into the Dragon. Fan. All those movies. I'd seen them all as a kid. I was into them all. You know, it was uh, the what was it? The the Last Dragon. The dragon that, yeah. Yeah. The, the, you know, all these crazy movies I watched as a kid growing up, and I was enthralled by uh, martial arts. I was enthralled by, but being enthralled by martial arts and having the ability to do it in my social life, I was in boarding school. I had a suitcase in my hand. On vacations, I was either at my parent, my one parent's house or my other parent's house. So there was no real home base to establish these social circles. Rugby practice was out of the out of the question. Going and playing soccer or football with my buddies was out of the question because I was, oh, I'm going to my dad's this weekend. Oh, I'm going to my mom's this weekend. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm doing So the social interaction, so I was never involved in a team environment. So when I came to the States and one of my friends turns to me and he says, come and check this class out with me. And I went and I met this big Bostonian Irish fella <laughs> called John Gilbert. God rest his soul. He passed away oh. in 2000 and, uh, 2006 or 2007. 2007, he passed away. Um, actually, on my brother's birthday, he passed away. Um, and mm. he, the only fight I ever knew him to lose was against cancer. So this was, the, the cancer took him. But he became this big brother figure, this this wings that covered this, I didn't have a real sense of family as such. My friends were my family and my mom was always working and it became this thing where I needed something to kind of take me away from the kids that were doing bad stuff. So I found this sense of family and I ended up turning to him one day and I said, I can't afford to pay for my lessons. And he says, well, your mother runs a cleaning company, doesn't she? I went, yeah. He says, well, I want you to bring in some of her cleaning supplies and I want you to vacuum the dojo and I want you to clean the mirrors and I want you to keep the place nice and tidy and that will be your payment. So that went on for about two years and um, something came up. My mother moved back to the UK and um, I had this in me. It was like a part of me that I wanted to be a black belt. And I met so many great people, and I was introduced to my mentor now, which is John Fritz. He's a uh, local master. He's been in the system since the late 60s. And um, he took me under his wing from a spiritual standpoint to kind of guide me through some dark times. Um, I had a real back, back, bad back injury in 2006. Uh, my mind went to a really dark place. Um, I, in 2005, my first child was born. I just bought the dojo. I just invested money in this studio. Yeah, studio. that's a lot. Back injuries do that to a lot of people. I have a couple friends. And then I was left shoulder over right hip. If I could show you. See if, I can, I see if I could do it. I was there. And oh. this is how I taught for 18 months. Oh, wow. my. That's amazing. So two, two back surgeries, and I didn't see myself coming out of it. And uh, lo and behold, this very kind friend, mentor, guidance, you know, guy for me, uh, he turns to me and he goes, you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And I got to that place where I was ready to make bad choices. And he said to me uh, in 2006, he said, you see that little blonde bundle of joy that's just come into your life? And I went, yeah. He says, that option's off the table. He says, you, you've got to be there for that boy. Who's now six foot four? And 14 years old, and He's 14, tall, six, four. 14 six, six, four. four and how tall six. are you? Because you seem like a really tall guy. How I'm, tall six, are you, I'm six two. Six two, and he's six, six foot four, Alan. I know. I've seen him. I used to live behind him. Wow. And he's, but he's, what, got, he's got shoulders like this and the big square jaw. And, so, and then I've got another one that's pints 
size and and he's all ripped and muscles and everything so yeah, anyway i mean it, it's a really amazing inspirational story and i love i mean i didn't know that much about you i've known you for a couple of years now and it, it's just really amazing what i want to ask what one of the things that i love about martial arts too is you said you're what a seventh degree Seven, yeah. Wow. How many degrees a, are there? Can someone just tell well, me? I don't know. In a lot of systems, they say tenth degree is grandmaster. Okay? okay. And you got to figure in a system of martial arts like ours that's been around since 1968, you've got a guy who started it as a fifth. He's worked through. He's now he, when he he was started it was a fifth, and people turned around to him and said. You've got to be the grandmaster of the system. You've got to make yourself a 10th degree, right? Mm -hmm. So now you've got all these people that are working along, working along over 50 years. And they get to 8th degree or ninth degree, and they're going, well, we've got all these guys coming up behind us that are like 5th, 6th, and 7th. And we're ninths, And you're still wearing a 10th, sir, and you can kick all our butts. What are we going to do? So Mr. Valari put 15 stripes on his belt <laughs> as being promoted by his top guys he said they said so we want you to put 15 stripes on your wow. belt so we have room to come to 10th degree and then we can move our people up so 15 is the highest in our system of martial arts and then i wear a seventh two of my teachers are ninths and tenths i have another guy that i train with i mean in the group that there are 10 10th degrees in our system wow wow one of Alan, I had no idea you were 10th degree. You've been keeping this from me? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get to the first degree. But anyway, I'm trying to get, to, I'm trying to get past the white one. But, um, you know, obviously it's an inspirational story, what you have. And it's not always about the, uh, you know, just about, you know, the fighting and the working out. There's a mental aspect to it, and we all have to work on that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. what I love about the, the martial arts also is that the higher you get in the belts, it's not like, oh, I'm a black belt. I'm going to kick your butt. Don't even talk to me. Don't even look at me. It's actually the opposite. You show more respect you when you're, you're, you have more respect when you learn more respect, right? Is that what it is? You end up in a place where you start to understand the compassion of, and forgiveness of a situation. Hmm. When you hold so much skill in your hands or so much power in your hands to cause so much, um, damage to a person you have to ask yourself well at least i would i would suggest to people that they embrace the idea when you have power you need to discover the compassion that goes along with it so you ask yourself when someone bumps you in the parking lot does this person deserve to get this just because i'm a little upset or should I take the higher ground and say, you know what? Today's your lucky day. I'm going to take that little bit of frustration. I'm going to put it in my box and save it for someone who deserves it. But then what do you do when the box gets full? You know, you, the box we would say is you open it up when the guy's breaking into your house <laughs> to, you know, to rape your wife or kill your kids. You know, someone's in your home looking to do you harm you open that box up and go i've been saving this for you <laughs> <laughs> and that's when, you know, it, it comes out but you'll notice on the wall behind me here there are five animals okay and our five animals are tiger leopard crane snake and dragon okay so the thing that keeps the the tiger the crane the snake and the leopard all with a, uh, a familiar note is they're all proactive creatures, right? Okay. So your personality could be one of those four, right? Okay. If you're a tiger personality, you're always in someone's face. You have an aggressive kind of mentality to you. You have this aggressive uh, go, 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 right? And you, there's not a lot of thought in what you're doing. You just go, go, go. And then you come to the leopard, and he's he's maybe not as much, but he's. Mm, I'm gonna. I, I want to talk to you about this, but uh, my friend has to come with me so that I'm confident enough to do it. And then you get the crane, and he's kind of. Uh, I really want to talk to you this, but I'm going to come back when it's a better time for you. Yeah. Okay. 
and now you have this different, and then the state goes, <clears throat> if you want to talk about this, just come and talk to me. Talk to me. No, you know, so, <laughs> it, it, it's that in and out. The dragon is what we all aspire to be. Uh, and if you notice on the hand, there's the first four, and there's the dragon. Oh wow! Okay, so the dragon gets to pick which one it wants to be. Ah. So it, it takes a mindset of, you know, like. I see pictures up there behind you, Miranda, of, I'm guessing, kids and stuff that you have, yes? Uh, no, this is actually the children's book that I... Oh, beautiful. Released. beautiful. Yeah, but I mean, so, so kind of kids. Yeah, these are my little so, blossoms. Im imagine... I am the guardian of the blossoms, and these are the blossoms. <laughs> <laughs> imagine a child comes to you and says, I want a cookie. Okay. And you go... <laughs> Well, you're not getting a cookie with that attitude, are you? Off you go. And then you get another one that comes along and goes, um, can I have a cookie? And they kind of, you know, wait for that answer and they say please and everything. And then the next one goes, hey, Jimmy, go ask mommy for a cookie, right? <laughs> so a divide and conquer kind of way, right? And then you've got the snake is kind of waits till mom's not around. And goes and gets a cookie. Right? Mom's just at it. <laughs> now you take it to the other side and you've got the mom. Kid comes to you and goes, I want a cookie. The tiger goes, No. The crane goes, Go sit on the couch and think about how you just spoke to me, and I'll think about giving you a cookie. The leopard goes, Wait till your father gets home. <laughs> the snake goes, Come here. Let's talk about this cookie. <laughs> Don't talk to me like that. And the dragon goes, so you think I'm going to give you a cookie asking me like that? You see how it, it plays the different yeah. mindsets? I think we have a children's book that we I think you heard. should. I, yeah, I think that's the yeah. uh, Chuck Norris writing the, you know, writing the words. Itself. Writing the kids book. Children's so book. The, I have a couple of colleagues who've written children's books. Um, my good friend, Tony DiTazario, uh, Dieter Lizzy, Dieter Lizzy. His wife's Angela. I graduated from high school with him. He's the guy that wrote or did all the uh, illustration for the Spiderwick Chronicles. Okay. You know the Spiderwick? Uh, sounds Spider familiar. Anyway, um, he's... <laughs> yeah, that one. <laughs> He's a, very, he's a very famous illustrator and artist. His wife's been pu published children's book, yeah. Everything's Better with Glitter. Um, he's, he's, they're just really fantastic people that everything has a little moral to the story. Yeah. Everything has a right. little thing to it. And they've said to me, you know, Dave, do you want to talk about you know, writing a book? And I'm going, Scare children half the time. Actually, can they join a competition for Mindy? But <laughs> yeah, they should. Actually, they should go to our Facebook page and our website. We have a, a contest going on that we're gonna. She's gonna be picking the winner out May fifteenth. Yeah. But we're actually, Dave, announcing the winner. But yeah, Dave, go ahead. I do want to get to a couple things because it's we got about nine minutes left. Um, <laughs> you know, again, one of the things that you do also is you basically keep keep the kids in line. If I want to say that way. You know, yeah. obviously, if, you know, someone's not doing well in their homework or they have an issue or whatever, you're triangle almost like a, yeah. you're, it's you're a, a figure. Test. Yeah, and that's part of the martial arts, too. It's not just teaching them about how they do these moves and balance mm -hmm. and everything else. It's about life skills, too. Yes, yeah. So we have six school rules. We have respect, effort, etiquette, sincerity, character, and self-control. It used to just be five school rules, effort, etiquette, sincerity, character and self-control but when you look at it from a premise of if you're not showing someone respect you're not following any of the rules mm. when you tell a child show good effort and they don't well they're not being respectful um, if you tell them to use etiquette first of all it's a big word that most of them don't understand and you break it down and you go well etiquette doing what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it rather than you know when you feel like it like yeah. telling our kids to tidy their room yeah, I'll get to it. You know, it's if instead of we've got people coming over, I want you to tidy your room. Can you do it now, please? Oh, oh my gosh, 
I don't have to do everything. No. So you end up in this place where the kids have these rules to follow, but if they don't understand that by breaking one rule, they're breaking all of the rules. Mm. So it ties it together. And then with the uh, parents, when they come in, I say, well, we have a triangle of trust. If the kids aren't doing good at school and they're misbehaving at home, but they're doing fantastic in the studio, in the dojo, why would I promote them? Mm. Because they're not actually following any of these school rules, right? Yeah. So by having them be respectful to their parents, uh, tidy the rooms when they're supposed to be tidy in the rooms, doing their homework without being supervised, demonstrating good character, you end up in a position where you have these kids who are self-motivating, self-checking, self-evaluating, and then they're also being good role models because other parents turn around and go, where, where, where did this come from with your child? They, they're respectful. They pick up after themselves. They, they, your kid's doing his own laundry? How do I train my child to do that? And all of a sudden, you have this uh, osmosis from household to household. Maybe not that they're interested in martial arts, but they're interested in the values right. that are being put into place. Now, we said something earlier about kids coming in and the uh, you bump into someone and we, we emotional box put it in, right? right? And bullying and being able to talk to someone and having a trusted adult to talk to because parents don't always want to come to their, their kids don't always want to come to their parents to talk. They, they're looking for someone to vent, but they're scared to tell their parents something in case they get in trouble for it. Right. And you end up having that child who doesn't know what a, who their trusted adult is because it hasn't been agreed upon by a parent that it's okay to talk to this person. Right. I have very much an open door policy with the kids in the dojo. If there's anything they ever need to talk to, someone they need to talk to, they can come and talk to me about it. And I say it to them because you see the kid that's wearing it on their shoulders as they walk in through the door. Uh, I'm watching the clock as well. Okay. Wait, wait, okay. But I do, actually, if I could just, just two Go things ahead. real quick. Um, yeah. And then we could do another one after this, if that's okay. But with the, um, just give your, first of all, give your contact information so people get a hold of you. Okay, so valariesofwellington.com is our website. Um, I'm also on Facebook as Valari Studios of Self-Defense Wellington. Um, my telephone number here at the school is 561-792-1100. We're located in the original Wellington Mall uh, in Wellington next to Checkers and where the old Boston Market used to be. Um, the old pink mall where the post office is. Uh, not the Wellington Green Mall because apparently my competition's just moved in there. But we'll see how that works. Well, yeah. But that's what I was going to ask you though because um, obviously we're doing this and people can't go to your studio. So, yes, we're running a virtual and, and we actually well. have, you know, listeners and viewers that are all over the country. Yes. So can they participate? Absolutely. I have a I have virtual classes for kids at 5:30 Monday through Thursday. Um, I have virtual classes for adults 6:15 until 7 o'clock Monday through Thursday. And then as they progress, I have advanced classes on Monday and Wednesday from 7 until 7.45. Now that's on this cur current uh, social distancing format where people aren't coming in. I had to compress some classes. But when it, this opens up again, there'll be even more um, virtual classes available. Nice. And the ability to record and archive the lessons will be there as well. So there's a lot of stuff that this has brought forward. I honestly wish we got into the virtual stuff six months ago because then it wouldn't be a surprise for anybody whenever this stuff happens. Um, I can be reached at senseidave2005 at yahoo.com. You call me at the studio, I can give you a week or whatever link to come and try the virtual classes. It's great for adults, not just for kids. Um, it's a good way to get a sweat on. Our first class, our 615 class for adults, is very much about the cardio aspect of things, teaching you about the relationship. I have a guy in here who's a, a, an avid tennis player, and he's like, it's improved my tennis game. I'm like, that's fantastic, because 
his relationship to the ground is better, how he rotates his spine is better, everything's mm. connected. So you end up in a position where posture changes, breathing changes, mental focus changes, uh, confidence changes. Uh, I said something in the past uh, thing I did with Alan on the radio that the definition of depression is dwelling on the past the definition mm. of anxiety is worrying about the future Ooh, if, you I love your, that. if you take your finger and put it on your nose do it okay. take your finger and put it on your Don't nose because i didn't okay. do a manicure okay. so now, <laughs> look at your finger and take a deep breath look at the tip of your finger take, take a deep breath you're in the present you can't be anywhere else. Love it. You can't, that is awesome. see, you can't see the front door. You can't think about the color of your car. You can't worry about what's in your mailbox. You can't think about what's outside when you're in the present because you have to be engaging three senses all at once. And to bring yourself into the present, that's what you have to do is engage three senses all at once. Touch, sight, and breath and it forces you into a posture where your respiration is better your organs are in better alignment your digestive system gets better your mind becomes clear you're oxygenating your system and you're in the now dave what i wanted to ask you was you know obviously you go around think people think of martial arts they think about like breaking wood you know, and all that goes with that. You know, the one thing well, I'm actually karate kid, karate yeah, actually, kid. actually, you know what? You stole my thunder right there, Miranda, because I was oh, gonna go. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, because when Dave, you were talking about all the movies like Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris movies and everything, I was gonna say I hope you, it wasn't the the Karate Kid that inspired you. But anyway, um, <laughs> but anyway, I loved it. I know I it was a good it. entertainment. You know, movie. Karate kid. Except okay, so. that I kind of looked like Ralph Macchio. At the time that the movie came out, so that wasn't so good. That well, maybe uh, most teenage girls looked like that at one stage, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> mine was very long, very long. <laughs> but, well, what actually, what I wanted to ask you about it, getting into the breaking wood, you know, when you go to hit wood, I think to me it's more mental than it is physical because I don't break wood. Okay, well, just say you, you know, you did something. When you go to punch, he just wants you to break something. Is really. Oh my God, <laughs> you just ruined this whole thing. Because I'm trying to think like it's a mental aspect to it. Because you got to punch through the wood. People are afraid that they got to punch the actual wood and not go through it. So it's like a mental mind state, uh, a mindset, to actually have to do something like that and not break your hand or anything. Okay, so. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna get into a lecture here. <laughs> go ahead. I love it. He's like, how do I respond to? I actually, so here's the funny thing. I had, this Could was one question I had in my. Down? This was the one question I had in my mind that I thought was going to be like the the golden moment of the whole show, and now yeah. it's like, oh, go, ahead, no. go ahead, Dave. Totally deflated <laughs> his ego and his hat. Okay, so what is the purpose of breaking wood? The pr purpose of breaking wood in most martial arts classes is to give the student a sense of accomplishment, um, a sense of focus, a sense of energy. Um, but realistically, if I was to hand you a breaking board, you could take it in your hands like this and probably snap it, okay? Some of it, yes. Some of these guys that are breaking, you know, roof tiles and and cinder blocks and all this I have, i've got guys that i train with that do all that stuff now mr valari would say any breaking that you do causes the ability for you to grip anything in your wrist it takes it away because it compresses all the metacarpals and your grip strength is reduced so if you have to put hands on someone your hands are weaker, okay? So by breaking something, you actually end up in a position where you're hurting yourself. Now. See, Alan, you don't want to do that to yourself. So the don't idea <laughs> of sending a thought through something, it's actually called a light bridge, okay? So let's say, for example, Miranda, you want to be able to play the guitar by the time you come out of quarantine. That would be really awesome. 
okay? And, and you, in impossible. your mind, <laughs> you in your mind, you close your eyes and you think, this is the piece of music I would love to be able to play, and this is how I would like it to be heard when I play it. So in meditation, you create this picture in your mind and how it sounds, how it feels, how the body reacts to it, and how you would like other people around you to react to this image, this, this mental picture that you have. Mm -hmm. So you've created a picture of success, and now you see where you are. <laughs> right? And you could play a note to save your life. I know I could, right? And I got three guitars in my house, and I can't play a note, okay? <laughs> so if you can imagine... But you look cool. But I, I look cool doing it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Little air guitar. <laughs> okay, so if you sit now and you feel where I am and how I felt about where I see myself going, you can create a path for yourself of success. Mm. So... What's the first thing I need to do? Well, if I want to learn to play the guitar, I got to take a lesson or I got to have a program or I got to have a this or a uh, musician, I think is the big thing they're advertising at the moment for you to learn how to play the guitar. So what's my first step? Okay, I've got to get that. So what are my goals in the interim? Do I want to build from the light bridge back or do I want to build from the light bridge forward? So having an attainable goal you have to be able to come from one side and the other and check in every so often. If I'm breaking a board, I'm seeing my hand on the other side of the board rather than on the surface of the board. That's thinking about A, B, C, right? Yep. The light bridge that I just talked about is thinking about A, C, B. If I know what A is and I know what C is, I can figure B out. Mm, if I, I know think. where A is, and i just thinking about B, and I don't know what my C is going to be, I'm kicking the can down the road. I've got no purpose mm. other than I just want to get a little further down the road. Hey, Miranda, weren't we talking about geometry the other day, how we, you, know, you don't need it? Well, here it is. You need it right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's, it's seeing in a I can visualize that. I can visualize yeah. that. I would say my problem actually was more with algebra which I can literally say I've never, ever used in my life. No, but that's, that's a great point, what you're making right there with right. the bridge. I mean, if, you yeah. get to the if you've got four cans of baked beans and six carrots, how many dollars do you need <laughs> at the cash register? Yeah. You have algebra right there. <laughs> so, so, Dave, <laughs> when... <laughs> All right, let He's me like, take, so like, Dave, a, are you still not going to break a board? <laughs> not break a board. <laughs> so, like, cool. well, can you kick the hat off the <laughs> <laughs> for you all day long? You just like wait, show wait, him wait. A, like a karate move or something. Yeah, but wait a minute. Wait, here's a you. here's a Chuck Norris one. <laughs> Dave, can you kick the hat off of my head from your studio over Zoom? Ooh. That would be a Chuck oh. Norris one. Um, all right, so wait. So here's another question for you, because you could work with everybody. So like. My daughter, yep. and I told you this story when she was, you know, six years old, she was a very shy, timid, she would hide, she would, even when my sister came over, she would run behind me and scream, and mm -hmm. she would be really timid, and we actually brought her to karate, and it actually broke her out of that, um, and then I'm, we have my grandson right now, who is the total opposite, and wild, and uncontrollable, ADHD, all over the place. Martial arts could help with both areas. Martial, uh, or what you do, you could bring someone in and work with both of them, right? I do. I, I, I work. Um, right now, I'm trying to schedule up uh, virtual classes for the Ernie Ailes Foundation for their adult recreation department, where I'm working with special needs with all levels of challenge. Um, I'm working with them. That. And then I work with the Arc of the Palm Beaches with their adult program. Um, I have uh, several kids here that I train with that have attention deficit. Uh, some of them are uh, borderline Asperger's. Um, there's other kids that come in that have quite severe rage issues, like they have um, anger issues that they lash out because they don't know how to communicate. Uh, and uh, that, that's a, t a point I wanted to bring up earlier, but I kind of forgot. Um, and then I have a little autistic girl who's 
brother is Spectrum. Her, tw her tw she's a twin. So her brother is on the Spectrum. She's autistic. They're seven years old. Their father just turned a hundred years old. Oh my. That's amazing. On the 16th of this month, he just turned a hundred years old. Wow. Okay. Their mother is, I would say, 50. And that's me being very careful about what I say. Um, Smart man. The, the social <laughs> dynamic is very interesting because you got the old man who's seen everything. He's married to this lovely Jamaican lady. The children are the same color as me. She is your typical Jamaican complexion. Um, he's this little old Jewish guy, little old white Jewish guy. And the kids are running around being kind of raised by the auntie and raised by the mother and the father's kind of like this. I mean, he's not the biological, but he's the man of the house. So you've got all these different. I'm really glad you cleared that up because I was a little confused there. I don't know if Alan was there with me, but I was like, I, I was. I just didn't want to say anything. So okay, good. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we were see, Alan, you yeah. and me. Oh, he's pops. I mean, that's what the kids call him. That's my dad, pops. He's married to this 50 year old woman, or, and it's a really strange dynamic. But that's what it is. When the child doesn't have the ability to communicate with a male role model, for example and gets away with murder with the two females of the house who are too busy trying to do everything else, what's the energy going to do, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like taking a Mentos and dropping it in a bottle of soda. The energy has to go somewhere, and it just explodes. <clears throat> explodes. Yeah. So you're having a reaction. Like you say, you have a, a, a grandson or whatever who's My nephew who's... My grandson has ADHD. Well, ADHD. he's not diagnosed, but right. But what are you? What you're saying is he's got ADHD. It must be he's all over the place. No, he's understimulated. The doctors. I mean, for the longest time, what was it? If you couldn't, uh, if they couldn't figure out exactly what was causing the pain, it was fibromyalgia. Yeah. Right. They pigeonhole a diagnosis mm. that suits the symptoms they see, but realistically, if that kid was running around a soccer field from 3.30 in the afternoon until 5.30, he wouldn't be doing this at the dinner table anymore. He'd be like, ah, I just want to eat and go to sleep, right? Yeah. No, I think there's a lot of truth The kid's not running any energy with the stones, you know? I think there's a lot of truth to that. It was obviously, you know, overly diagnosed and people were put on Ritalin at one time and now it's like Adderall. <laughs> However, I do believe, and I want to be cautious here during this podcast, that there are some people who, who really do have this. And oh, absolutely. I know adults with it. What? Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I'm a second. You I'm know, one right here. Right? <laughs> yeah. But but I think you're right though. I it's true. I mean, if you're sitting watching video games and most of your diet is ninety percent sugar, well, yeah, you're going to be bouncing off walls. I mean, some physical activity. Well, right? again, get and into Alan, the. You're working out. You're working out, buddy. Well, Take the I gotta get. Out. I gotta get back. That's your challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, but the whole point of that was is that you know whether I mean you could work with both ends of the spectrum. If someone was diagnosed with Everybody. ADHD, if right. someone was diagnosed with something else, you know, you could work with them and help them out in, in different ways and help them. You know, the ADHD is more about focusing on the mind and controlling the mind. ADHD is about a overstimulus of one side of the brain and an understimulus of the other side of the brain. Okay. So it's been proven that if you create a circle and a line at the same time, you bring whole brain synchronization together. So if I make a circle and then a line, I make it in both sides of my brain work. If I take a circular step and a linear punch, I make it in both sides of my brain work. Wow. That's interesting. So my, sorry. That's really interesting. I never heard that before. I learned something. It's <laughs> so good for people with ADHD. ADHD is literally your left side of your brain's doing this and your right side of your brain's doing this. Right? Okay. 
So one side's creative and it's doing so, and the other one wants to, you know, do something else. And you're going, well, 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 this one, but I want to go that way. No, 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 no. Oh, shiny objects. I want to go that way. We call it monkey mind, right? It actually looks like a dance move. <laughs> it does. <laughs> <laughs> you you think about a monkey, right? Monkey's got a, a, a little piece of fruit and it and it goes, Oh, what's that over there? And, oh, it's back there. and oh, it's over there again. Monkey mind is its shiny objects take you off in different directions, right? So my sister, who lives in England, she's done a study on child behavior, and I believe there's five things that the child's mind looks for when it sits down to the table to do work. It asks, am I hungry? Am I thirsty? Is there something shiny? Is there something uh, for me to listen to? And who is with me? So the brain is going, what's there? What's there? What's there? What's there? What's there? Well, if you take the food and the water out of the equation, oh, look, I've got water. I can, I can drink my water. Oh. oh, look, I've got a snack. I can eat my snack. There's nothing to force them to do the work. Now, you play classical music, the brain goes into a different sync. It's listening to the music, and all of a sudden, the kid's starting to pay attention to the work they're doing, right? So you've now got a creative thing happening that stimulates the mind, and now you've got your work in front of you, and you're getting to do something, okay? So monkey mind get, takes you here and takes you there. Whole brain synchronization in the martial arts. As simple a movement as that. Wow. What? I'm diving happen? in the pool, right? Diving in the pool. I'm diving in the pool. There's a circle and a line. Ooh, I like that. Okay. Dad. And, and then if you want to get fancy, you can you can do the teacup, but that's that's a completely different it's a different wow. exercise for a different day. I would so, never think there would be a karate move called the teacup. Well, Learn it's actually a meditative move and you think about a Chinese teacup in your palm. Okay. Wait, show me. So I'm going to stand up and do it, okay? Okay. So the idea is it comes through out, and you're paying attention to how it moves, and then it comes up, and it actually loosens your shoulder and your spine, but your concentration is on one point. Oh, that's so cool. That really is. And it's something for you to do where you're making a line, and you're making a concentration, and your brain comes into sync. So it's something to bring you into the moment, into the present. You're doing something, you're watching, you're feeling, you're breathing, and it's coordinating it with how you're standing on the floor. But you're also bringing your brain into a whole brain sink, so now you can concentrate better. So you mentioned meditation a couple of times. Do you also teach meditation here, or is that just part of the – part of the? Okay. Um, all right, here we go. Here we go I'm, again. I'm, 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 this is me – Getting ready to blow your mind. <laughs> Should you I, I hold my hat down? Yeah, okay. hold it down because it's going to blow off. Have you he's gonna ever, it with his mind. <laughs> have you ever gotten in the car and driven somewhere and forgotten the journey? Oh, yeah, all the time. Yeah, all the time. That's active meditation. You're meditating. You're actually in a place where your brain is in a test tone. You know what you're doing and you're just going where you need to go. Meditation can be as simple as concentrating on, I breathe in for three steps, I hold my breath for two, and I breathe out for three steps. Wow. A conscious walking and breathing and feeling your posture. Um, I Every say time you that, say that, I know I'm slouching. Yeah. <laughs> Every time you <laughs> say the posture, I'm like... <laughs> I'm, I'm leaning into the computer right now myself, so... Could I say that I'm being hypocrite? I mean, if I'm really being proper, I'm sitting upright and blah, blah, blah. But we don't, do we? we <laughs> oh, no. They don't call it a lazy boy chair for nothing. There's no support <laughs> in it, right? Um, so the, the idea of just actively paying attention to how you breathe, mm. how you feel when you step out of bed in the morning, how you stand up in the morning before you walk to the bathroom, Think about that, Alan. <laughs> I think about that about 20 times a night, but anyway. <laughs> no, no, I think that's, that's so important because I, I told a friend of mine that that's why when I go for walks at the park, when 
I've got a lot on my mind and my thoughts are racing or I'm emotional, I'll just go. And it's like, I do, I kind of get in my zone where I'm not really paying attention. And then I have those moments. Uh, ironically, at the moment, I have a cousin from Northern Ireland who's in Texas. I think I mentioned her the other day. And she came on and she did this podcast with somebody else. And she's now into this holistic, uh, natural health for women and what you should do with your inventory in the morning. You take an inventory of your body. What hurts? What do I need to stretch? Blah, blah, blah. And more and more of my family in particular are becoming more aware of the alternative healing and the alternative psyche. And it's really strange because we're a business family. We're car trade, horse trade, um, auctioneers, you know, all of these prof professional sales positions and corporate positions in our lives. My sister's a, a graduated with honors in law, and now she's doing uh, retreats for people so that she can do uh, a study of what your personality is. Are you a pleaser? Are you a giver? Are you a this? Are you a that? And it all relates very much to this holistic approach to your personality. Yeah, that's something we use um, in sales a lot, the, the, the personal traits. Are you amiable? Are you a driver? Are you this? You know, so it's right. pretty much the same. So when we were talking the other day, I said about these animals on the back wall. Well, if you're in a sales situation and you're a, <clears throat> you're a this, this is the car I have for you. You're going to buy it and you're going to leave with it. You got the little woman that goes, give me the piece of paper to sign and I'll leave. So your traits of are you a pleaser, are you this or that, it, it comes very much to where you are in your mind and where you are as a personality person. Um, but I have I was talking to my cousin in Texas who she's telling people, breathe in for four, breathe out for four. But if you breathe in for four and breathe out for four and there isn't a suspend in the middle, your body doesn't get a chance to oxygenate. So when I spoke to her, I said, let's breathe in for three, hold it for two, exhale for three to four. Now you have a timing of breath, a timing of oxygenation, and also a place for your mind to get clear. So you become aware of breath, aware of body, aware of being in the now. And whatever action you're going through as you do it, you become part of the present, which eliminates anxiety, depression, etc. So you're now in a place where you go, well, what's my timing? When do I want to breathe in and when do I want to breathe out? You start, you ever like sink yourself to the bottom of the swimming pool and you sit on the bottom of the pool and go, well, when am I going to go up? You're no longer in a panic. Yes, I did that all the time. Like little pee parties. <laughs> I'm trying to picture your cousin. Like, does she have like an Irish Texas accent? Like, how does okay. that work? So, that's so going to be captivating. This is, this is the funny part. She's from Northern Ireland. She's married to a fella from New Zealand. She has two children that go to school in Texas. So can you imagine the accents of the children? <laughs> that is going to be interesting. I would pay to yeah. listen to that, actually. Yeah. You know? So, But yeah, she's very much that Northern Ireland accent. Mine has softened over the past 30 years of being here. But she's not long out of our Northern Ireland. When the big spill happened with BP, when the yeah. oil rig, you know, the big spill yeah. in the Gulf, she was in charge of one of the cleanup, the corporate cleanup crews. For that, that was her. Oh, nice. uh, She's a, a marine biologist specialist, blah blah blah, and she worked for BP. Wow. So he came out of the corporate world because it was so stressed and had such an adverse effect on her body that she then approached this nutritional approach and health approach, not so that she could end up doing it for other people, but so she could find her own health yeah. path, yeah, her but own you, nutritional you know, path. You know, you mentioned a couple of things that are real interesting because. First of all, oxygen is what's needed, obviously, to breathe, but it's also needed to heal the body in general. Um, you know, we, I've dealt with a lot of people. My wife uh, is in, you know, did wound care. She used hyperbaric chambers to help with the wound care. Um, I talked to the, um, uh, the 22 Project who deal with veterans with PTSD. They use hyperbaric chambers to help with that. The more oxygen gets into the system, the more it could heal. Now, in saying that, you know, the alternative is you could use 
medication too. And I'm not telling everybody everybody not to use medication. It's needed in in certain in certain circumstances. That's prescribed. That's prescribed. That's Thank prescribed. you. Thank you. But what you're talking about can also help. You know, the thing about medication is there's side effects. You know, right. you're going to have certain type of side effects. Mm -hmm. You know, some people get it more than others. Breathing and having the oxygen, what you're talking about, there's no side effect to it unless you hold your breath too long. You need but, to come up to the surface of the pool, is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I agree. You know, Alan, you, we talk about this all the time that it shouldn't just be, and a lot of Americans are special like this, they just want to pop a pill. And that will solve everything and diet, sleep, oxygen, meditating, all of those things really play a critical role. We all hear it, but I don't think people realize how imperative that is. When we've had Dr. Sinclair on, this yeah. man is a medical doctor and he said sleep and sleep and sleep yeah. and avoid mm -hmm. sugar and sleep. And, and those are the best things you could do. And everything we talked about, Dave, that's what you basically do. You do physical activities, right. you do mm -hmm. meditation, you do the breathing exercise. Everything is in one place with you, right? Right. Basically. And then you have your mental state and your release. I mean, I had a lady come in to me, let's say, for example, we'll call her Jean. That's not her name. Um, we'll <laughs> we call got her that. Jean. And uh, uh, she came to me after a horrible breakup. And she was in this emotional place in her in her life. And she was a successful woman in her uh, in her, her workplace and very talented salesperson and she came in one day and I noticed her body was doing this and I sat with her on there and I said you know you look like you're carrying a lot of stuff um, I'd like to give you permission to let that stuff out and she goes what and I said okay so I set up a heavy bag and I picked up a stick and I walked over to the heavy bag and I said I stand back a little bit. I'm going to show you something, and I want you to do what you saw. And she goes, oh, okay. And she's looking at me like I got like a horn growing out of the side of my head. And, and I go, oh, God, when I hit the bag, and she goes, ooh. And you just see that, ooh, you know, that kind of excitement. And I hand her the stick, and I go, do what you saw. And she goes, whack. And she hit the thing. And I went, okay, watch again. And I did it a slightly different way than she did it. And she goes, ooh. And... I hand her the stick again and she goes, Crack! and you hear that sound and she goes, oh. and it was like, a, oh, I got to do that. And I said, okay, take the stick away from her. And she's like, oh. give me the stick back. And I said, how did that make you feel? And she goes, I liked it. And I go, okay, you liked it. I said, would you like to do it again? She goes, oh yeah, please. I want to do it again. I want to do it again. And I hand her the stick again. And I said, now, I want you to take in your mind and I want you to draw a picture of exactly what is causing you to feel like this. And she goes, ooh. And you see like these little horns do this here. And I go, no. And she goes, ah. And you see the eyes do this and this body do this here. And the noise just echoed through the room. And I went, Give me that stick. And she goes, ah, give me the stick. She wanted it back. She wanted it back. I said, okay. I said, do you want to do this again? She goes, yes, yes, yes. I said, how does it make me feel? She goes, ah, better. It makes me feel better. I said, okay. Here's the stick. I have a class to go into. There's another bag in the room. Take the stick. Go into the room. Hit it as much as you want. You have my permission. Don't worry about the amount of noise you make. Don't. I see her come to me about five minutes later because the noise stopped. And she goes, I broke your stick. Can I have another one? Oh, wow. She had a lot of aggression. And yeah. the tears are running down her face. Mm. Not because she broke the stick, but because she was given permission to purge this anger and frustration and and sheer rage that she'd been packing down for so long. And someone had told her, it's okay to let it out. Mm -hmm. Just let it out where it 
it's safe, don't let it out on society. And you see a lot of these people who have all of this packed up, bent, pent up stuff going on, whether they internalize it, which is what we want to avoid by the association, um, or they vent it on other people, which brings our these massacres in society where there's a lack of communication, there's a lack of being able to find an outlet for this thing or people that they feel they can trust to talk to. And now all of a sudden we're going, it's okay to let it out, but let it out into this or let it out into that. Or you don't have to keep up with the team. You can have your own journey of success and put your energy into this beautiful, satisfying art that allows you to be in the present, breathe, have a physical expression, see physical accomplishment within your own right, and it allows you to excel and leave the room with a confidence that allows you to feel that should something come to me and try to force its will upon me, I have the strength of will myself to put my own feelings and my own self and my own self-identity before that that's trying to overtake my life. And you have all of these characteristics and all of these tools in something that has stood the test of time for thousands of years. You know something, I, I just gotta, there's two points here that I think that are extremely important. And you mentioned one thing that I think is probably more important than, uh, and Miranda, we speak, uh, spoke about a lot of things. We've had some great people on with meditation, with yoga, mm -hmm. with you know, yeah. physical fitness, with doctors, with you know, psychologists, everything. And I think the most important point is when you said, think, take a moment to think. And I just, I think that's a real important tool that we need to use more of because like when I had my baseball team, and this is the way I'll explain it, I had a travel baseball team I started up um, up in Massachusetts and we did, you know, it's basically, I called it a suicide prevention youth baseball travel program. It wasn't, I wasn't preaching youth, I wasn't preaching a, uh, preaching suicide prevention, but I was trying to give them tools, life tools in there. And one of them was like, if you made an error or if you swung and missed and struck out, I don't want you just to walk back and say, okay, I struck out or I made the error and, you know, be upset. I want you to take that split second, think about what happened. Why did you miss that ball? And then you forget about it. But if you understand why you did it, it's going to help you in the future. And it's the same thing you were just saying right now with when she was beating up on the bag, getting all that frustration out. And you said, take a minute, think of how that made you feel. I think that is a real important tool to do because if she just kept it's on going, beating I'm sorry? It's called feeling intelligence. That's we can interesting. Think, we can think about something or we can feel about something you can think about a person or you can observe your feelings about that person you can think about a situation or you can feel about this uh, it's all about thinking is here. feeling is here yeah feeling is a heart-based emotion thinking is a this you got to make sense of it if you think you ask if you ask a child to analyze what he did he's going to say immediately, I missed the ball. Right. Recognizing and acknowledging a moment of failure. If he hasn't been pre-prepared um, for the idea that there is no such thing as failure, there's only a lack of preparation. Well, that's part of the preparation to fail, because you need to fail to understand what you're doing and how to improve. Right. Yeah, but see, you're using, you're using that word again, fail. There is no failure if he acknowledges that there was a lack of preparation, if he learns from it. Mm. Right. If he learns, you're saying, think about why, what you did wrong. And, oh, I need to practice my swing more. I need to practice more batting cage time. I need to practice this. I need to prepare more for this situation so I can see how I can take my life to the next level. As you're talking about the kid that misses the ball, there's three things that are going to come into the kid's head. 
Uh, I missed the ball a few times too many today. Uh, I, I let the team down because I didn't get the, the innings that I needed for us to win. Uh, I need to practice more. There's three things that immediately the kids put in a negative in his head. Right. If he said, I supported my team by being there and cheering. I did my best when I got to the plate. I ran as fast as I could to catch the ball when it was necessary. I just didn't hit as good as I should have today. There's three positives to the one negative. You, the kid's already starting with a 75% grade, and he's got 25% to make up instead of 75% negative to make up and 25% of a grade. So if we can encourage the children to see the positive of their actions and expand upon it instead of the negative of their actions and dwell on it where it becomes the thing that absorbs their life, you now have a premise of growth through a positive rather than dwelling on a negative. And that's yeah. interesting that you mentioned the failure because I always look at it as failure. So I think that's an interesting twist of just saying lack of preparation um, <clears throat> because, you know, and using the, the whole baseball analogy that everyone brought up, I'm not a huge fan of the whole like participation awards, mm -hmm. but I also think you need to teach children mm -hmm. um, and maybe the word should be how to prepare versus how to fail because that is where you grow. Mm -hmm. Not everything is just going to come easy to you. You just know right. how to do everything. And how boring would that be? But there are people out there when something happens and it's not the way they planned or they weren't prepared, that's when they just, they don't know how to deal with it. Well, Instead again, that's of what's looking great. it as a positive thing, like, no, 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 this is an opportunity for you to grow in a way that you didn't think was possible because you didn't know. And that's what's great Absolutely. about the martial arts because, again, when you go to another belt, it's not a participation award. You have to earn it. You see, you see this, these little Chinese letters on my shirt right here? You see yep. these little, yeah? Yeah. It translates yeah. into work hard and you shall be rewarded. Mm. Not show up and get a prize. Okay? <laughs> is, that, is that what it actually means? <laughs> it does actually mean work hard oh, and does. you shall be rewarded. Yes. Oh, okay. These, these Chinese letters right here translate into... Work hard and you shall be rewarded. Okay. Now, can you say that? It's on, all of, it's on all of our patches. It's on all of our information. Um, it is our school creed. Work hard and you shall be rewarded. And I've put it on the board. I have a chalkboard here that we have little sayings, and it says, in the beginning, have the end in mind. I love good in that. the beginning, good in the middle, good at the end, right? So the kids come in here, and their parents go, When's Jimmy going to test again? And I said, when Jimmy starts practicing the material that he has, he'll be invited to test. When Jimmy isn't doing what Jimmy knows he's supposed to do, how can I reward him for not doing what he's supposed to and promised to do? When each kid gets a belt, they have to make a promise to earn and respect the belt each and every day they have it. Not each and every day they wear it, but each and every day they have it. Because if a child is misbehaving outside of this, these four walls, they're working hard in here, they love Master Dave because they're scared to death <laughs> that I'm going to not invite them to test, right? right? I give them the, what do you think you're doing? And they go, oh, oh, oh i got to punch harder, i got to punch faster, right? Do you but, have the stick in your hand? No, I'm kidding. Usually, yes. <laughs> that, that, that could be it. <laughs> out there. So you, you've got these kids, and the, they leave here, and the parents go, well, here's his belt. And I go, well, what are you giving me his belt for? Well, he slapped his sister. Well, really? Yeah, he slapped us. I said, good, give me the belt. Hang the belt up. When is it appropriate for that child to get the belt back? When he's behaving well in class or when he's behaving well at home? Now you have a scale. What is it that's happening at home that makes him want to lash out? But when he's here, he behaves. So perhaps there's more structure here than there is at home. Mm. Then he goes to school and his grades are failing. 
well, he behaves well at home and he behaves well with you, but he's not doing well in his grades at school. Okay, so he's not an academic. Or, like my youngest was, he's dyslexic, mild dyslexia, he has trouble processing it, he needs some special attention on his grades. So the triangle of trust that we call it puts you in a position where you start feeling, well, he's doing really well here, he enjoys the structure. Is the structure being carried on at home? Or is he here because there's no structure and they don't have time at home to put a structure in place? And now you gotta go, well, what's lacking in this child's life for him to exceed in all three points? If life at home is good and life at school is good and life is here it's good and it's reinforcing the six school rules as we go through them, all of a sudden you, you have a well-balanced kid who's recognized by other parents and kids as being a well-balanced kid and they go, well, well how is he, he like that and my kid's bouncing off the walls? Oh, it must be ADHD or it's an understimulus, an understimulization of the child's life and he's coming home, he's not taken out to play baseball, he's not taken out to run, he's not taken out to play catch with his dad, his dad's never home, he sits in his room playing violent video games because that's what all his friends are doing and now all of a sudden he's got all of this emotion and the only thing he can associate with is violence or the expression of violence and he can't do it on his video games because he turns that violence inwards and all of a sudden you have a, a kid that doesn't have an outlet, has nobody to talk to, no one to associate with, no other kids that he can relate to. You have a lack of exercise, which is a stimulus for both the body and the brain, uh, a lack of uh, oxygenation, which creates healthier brain function, a lack of whole brain integration from a front punch, half moon, blah, blah, blah. You have a whole body mechanic that comes together in a system that realistically has been here for a long time but some parents see it as violence others see it as a discipline others see it as the lot we see it as sometimes the last step for a child before he's lost into a system that doesn't really care about him you know i gotta say something i'm saying something, and, and i'm saying this in the in the best sense this isn't you know it might come out as a joke but it's not a joke you know basically you're a, a trainer you're a Med you do meditation, you're a yoga instructor, you're a health fitness, you're, and you're a psychologist, and you're a big brother. I mean, Unlikely. What, yeah. and a life, basically, you do, and I know it might sound funny to say all that stuff, but it's true. You're, that, yeah. That's what you do. You're a renaissance man. Yeah, that, that's yeah. basically what that's you what do you, there. Yeah, you are. That's great. I will never look at karate the same again, ever. See, it's, it's tough to... You could say it. You could say it. <laughs> it's tough to say I'll never look at karate the same because there's no such thing as a bad art. There's only bad instructors. Okay? There's a... Hey, me on How are you? Come here. Come here. Am I get, what, am I getting slapped? I got... Hold on. I've got a gentleman that just went in the room that turned 100 years old Oh. oh my God! God bless him. Oh, happy birthday! Oh my this God! So cool. This is so cool. <laughs> oh, I love it. Now you know I took a you know a little karate class or something for like a few weeks. My my mom signed my sister and I up when we were kids, and of course you know that was when Karate Kid was out, and I thought it was really cool. But you know we for whatever reason, couldn't afford to keep taking the classes, but it really gave me, a, like this, is really giving me a deeper understanding and appreciation for the art. Yeah. And I took it, I went twice, and again, I didn't continue, and I really wish I did. I mean, Were you, you young? Know, like, Were you dead when you did it? Yeah, I did it. I did it with my best friend growing up, and we did it together, and, uh, you know, it was more like, you know, just to go and do something. It was, it right. was, but now you know, I like, I want to do it, especially when he started talking about the woman with the bag. Yeah, like, I <laughs> because I know like for me, like when I lift, when I lift weights versus when I go walking, they're like completely different exercises for me. So when I go walking for, for meditation and when I lift weights, 
it's more for a sense of empowerment. You know, yeah, like if, you basically get everything in one with doing this. You say, I, that's right. why I've been trying to get my son to do it. And, why you know, don't you I, just do that? well, we have to, but I saw what it did for my daughter. I really did when she was young. Unfortunately, she stopped when she was about, I guess she started when she was about four or five. She stopped when she was about nine. Um, but it did wonders for her. It really yeah. was great. Yeah. But, like, what did you notice in her? Because that's quite a long time that she was in it then. Yeah. She was in it for about four years. Yeah. And I would definitely do it. I mean, if you and your um, son, I would go. I would yeah, definitely the big, go. The biggest I'd like to thing, learn some self-defense, you know? Yeah, but you know, the other thing it does is, <coughs> excuse me, it brings out confidence in people too. Right. See, there are three parts of the mental health aspect, <laughs> excuse me, that I look at. Um, that people really need help with. First of all, and I think the, one of the biggest ones is confidence. People that have um, a lot of depression, anxiety, a lot of times it has to do with self-confidence. Right. Know, I, I will tell you myself, when I worked out like a fiend, and I told you, I worked out six days a week, two hours a day. I had 7.8% body fat. I was in like... I want to see I was pictures. In, I want to see. Yeah, I do have pictures, but you know... I don't Come like on. looking at them now because I look at myself. But anyway, right now. No, you can't do that though because no, I know, you're I'm doing joking. it. I'm joking. No, 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 you're back I'm on track. Joking. I'm joking. But the confidence <laughs> that brings out. We didn't even get to sing happy birthday or anything. Yeah, he told me off because I didn't go to see him on his 100th birthday. Well, oh, my God. Did. I can't blame him. He's waiting for me over there for us to get done. All right, Aww. so we'll finish up shortly. <laughs> No, no, no. It's, it's all right. It's all right. Take your time. Take your time. No, we were just talking about karate and how both of us were exposed and actually what is we what is your form for a little bit what, what's your form of the I martial teach arts Shaolin Kempo karate it's a blended a blended self-defense art can you say that one more time what was that Shaolin <laughs> Shaolin Kempo karate was that rich, uh, where was that originally Shaolin is okay so it's an American system mm -hmm. the gentleman who founded the system was Fred Valari he founded the system in 68 this year he's 70, 75, 76, 76 on June 25th. He shares his birthday with my, my son. Um, mm. So he'll be 76 this year. He started training in the martial arts at five and six years old with his father. Wow. He was a karate wow. guy and a boxer. And he did uh, different stuff. And then he was a airborne ranger during, yeah. So he's done a lot of stuff. Um, he's partially just responsible for the development of the crowd Maga system. Oh, really? Um, a lot of, oh. yes. Um, this I found out. Krav Maga is the Israeli Special Forces art. Right. Okay. Um, he didn't, you know, I was talking to him about three weeks ago, and we're talking about, oh, I get a lot of calls for Krav Maga, and I get a lot of calls for this, and I get a lot of, he goes, really? He says, well, I helped develop the Krav Maga system. So, and I go, what? That's what Mark you know, Astor so does, <laughs> Miranda. Miranda, that's what oh, Mark that's Astor does. me. Here's me talking to people on the phone going, yeah, our system's very similar to Krav Maga. And in actual fact, our founder created I'll develop it. <laughs> there's yeah. there's going to, there's, well, says th helps a little bit, but he's the one that says they called him up to come and help establish the system. So yeah. if you're being called by Israeli special forces to come and help teach a particular thing for the military, yeah, are you helping create it or <laughs> are you, are you creating it for them? So there'll be people that argue with that. And I, I'm not getting into a he said, she said stuff. This is just something I was told. Um, and then uh, he was trained and trained and trained. He went around and he did his military service. And then in 68, he felt he had something to contribute. Because his way of making sure that he knew his stuff was going and challenging other school owners. Mm. So he would go, and go, let me see your top student. I want to fight. And this is... This 50, sounds like Karate 60. Kid. I swear yeah. this is yeah. an episode <laughs> okay. of Karate yeah. Kid. <laughs> yeah. So he would go and he would challenge. And if he beat the top student, he would then turn around and say, this is your best student. Okay. Let me challenge you. And the instructor would go, oh, no, no, no. no. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, you want to know something uh, true? That, that's pretty much like a Bruce Lee story. That's what Bruce Lee yes, did, isn't it? Very, very <laughs> like a Bruce Lee Look at Lee all story. of us with our movie references. No, but yeah. well, Bruce Lee is a live person. That was, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. He so, was awesome. My yeah. dad loved him. As time goes by, they finally turn around to him and they go, 
we don't know what to do with you. You're beating up all our guys. You're better than some of us. What do you want to go away? And they said, do you want to be a fifth degree, a sixth degree? So he says, just give me a fifth and I'll go away. And he went off and he formed his own system. And the guys that came in under him said, you've really got something here. So you should be the grandmaster of your own system. Mm -hmm. So in council, they said, right, we're making you the 10th degree black belt of your own system. And then people started coming up on, on, under him. But the Shaolin Kempo Karate, it takes the, if you were to imagine driving your car, right? Um, karate is like driving a Ford Fusion down the street. It's got four wheels, it's got a steering wheel, it's got four seats, it gets you from point A to point B. It's simple. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to drive it, okay? Kempo is more like driving a Ferrari, okay? There's a particular finesse, there's more parts to it. It's a, it's a more integrated, more complicated system, and there's more things to it. Shaolin is like driving a Formula One car where just to get it to start, you have to have a particular type of training. And it's very fine-tuned, very, um, there's a lot of finesse to it, but you don't necessarily want to go to the grocery store in a Formula One car, right? <laughs> you, you'll go in the Ferrari, but the Ford Fusion will work. They all do the same thing. They all get you from point A to point B, different finesse required, different speed, different everything to them. And Shaolin Kempo takes it where you have a appropriate response for each one in the circumstances you need it. The Shaolin is very much about the meditation and the energy. The Kempo is very practical, multiple uh, person scenario. And then your karate is boom, get it done. So realistically we should probably call it karate kempo shaolin but because you're learning karate first then your kempo then your shaolin stuff because it takes a finesse but integrating it all together everybody needs to know about posture everybody needs to know about breath everybody needs to know about focus yeah oh, oh, got a, oh, every, every right? time yeah, you everybody. say that <laughs> i do but i'm like we're in, I'm being always we're in like a position this. where you have um a particular finesse required for each thing. So let me tell you, um, I, I, I got to tell you, we have about four minutes left and I want you to go. I don't want that gentleman to be waiting. He's a hundred years old. He should take precedence over us. But you know, I love talking to you. The information you give out is yeah. just amazing. The way you do it is incredible. Mm -hmm. I do want you to give your information so people can get in touch with you and hopefully you okay can so valari studios is self-defense in wellington florida phone numbers 561-792-1100 uh, our website is valarisofwellington.com that's v-i-l-l-a-r-i-s-o-f wellington.com um i can be reached through the website i can be reached we have virtual classes we're on facebook uh, Valari Studios of Self Defense, Wellington, Florida, on Facebook. Um, I'm also on Facebook personally, David Wilson. Um, <laughs> so, Miranda, why don't we do this? Do you have? I want you to finish up whatever you want to say, and then let's let Dave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out with a a strong message for everybody. No, I think you pretty much covered it. I think I just wanted to make sure because we are you know, worldwide. So I want to remind ever, all of our listeners that you don't have to reside in Wellington, Florida. No, class. I'm not not Wellington, New Zealand, because there is a martial arts school in Wellington, New Zealand as well. Oh, <laughs> wow. Note to self. <laughs> and I'm looking forward. I want to use that stick. <laughs> all right. Final thoughts. <laughs> final thoughts. Um, Breathe and keep your head up. Always be looking forward. Always keep your heart open because good things will come to you. And uh, when in doubt, talk to someone who's, who cares and is willing to listen. 80% of therapy is listening. 80% so of the therapist's sorry, job what? is listening. 80% <laughs> <laughs> Gotcha. 
Yeah. Well, Dave, I, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a therapy thing at the moment with my sister and my brother. They're like cats and dogs over in the UK because my mother's not particularly well. I'm and sorry. Oh, one, sorry. You know, my, my sister was looking after her for a while. And my sister's been the information person for the past 30 years, giving my brother information yeah. about how mom's doing and what she's doing. And she's been to the hospital and she's been this. And in the past four months, she's been living with my brother. And she's like, he doesn't tell me how she's doing. She doesn't. Da, 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 da. Mm. And it's the difference in the communication. You know, you, you, people are, some are good communicators, some are bad communicators. But ultimately, it comes down to listening to the person and seeing how they're, they're doing. But well, we well, definitely enjoy listening to you. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been a real pleasure. Miranda, it's been a true pleasure meeting you. I so, look forward to seeing you in the future. Yes. And we'll Alan, definitely love to have you on again. Anytime. Anytime. You want to make it a weekly spot, I'll jump on. I don't care. That sounds great. You have a wealth of information. So thank you very much, Dave. I really appreciate it. Take care. And I just want to let everybody know and remind everybody that you matter. And, yeah. uh, you know, Miranda, last words? Last words, I think, uh, I think our friend helped make a difference. I know I'm, I'm already. Look at my posture. <laughs> you like that? I you already made a difference it. right now. Look at it up. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. All right. Take, Take care. care. Bye. 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 For more Real Combos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel.